Secession and the failure of compromise. Let's get started. So, after Lincoln's election in November of 1860, southern states are divided over the process of secession. Some people, who we'll call secessionists, want each state to break away from the Union right now, immediately, on their own, break away as soon as possible. Other Southerners who are upset at Lincoln's election will refer to as cooperationists. Uh, these people believe that the slave states should act as a unified group and make the decision to formally secede from the Union together. Now, had the cooperationists won out, there would have been a delay. It would have taken longer. And there would have been a greater opportunity to reach a compromise with the North and therefore no need to secede. Go ahead and pause the video, add an illustration in your notes for the debate between secessionists and cooperationists. Remember, South Carolina is crazy, and South Carolina damages the cooperationists' efforts. They are the first to, to secede from the Union on December 20th in 1860. Now, the decision was made by a special convention called in South Carolina. People sent delegates to make this decision. And they strongly believed in something that had been first proposed by Jefferson and Madison in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And that is the compact theory of government. This belief that our federal government was created by a voluntary bond between the states and the national government. And that that bond could be broken when one part decided to. Here's what they said in their announcement of secession that a sectional party had elected a president whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. South Carolina is the first to secede. However, this, um, the cooperationists do not do very well in the rest of the South. They have some success in Texas, some success in Louisiana and Georgia. But by February 1st, all seven of the states in blue on this map have seceded from the Union. South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. What we might think of as the Deep South is completely removed from the Union, in their opinion, by February 1st of 1861. We're only a few months after Lincoln's election. Well, why hasn't the Upper South succeeded? For people in the Upper South, those states in gray, Lincoln's election is not enough to push them to that radical of an action. Remember, this region is much more economically diverse and therefore not as reliant on slave labor. Also, this is where the Constitutional Union Party did uh, the best. Unionists are strong here, people who want to hold the nation together. Perhaps some of them recognize that any fighting between the North and the South would probably take place in their backyard and really, really hurt them. Also, you have a lot of former Whigs in this area. And remember, the Whigs are the party of compromise. They were a party brought together on compromise. Remember, the only thing they had in common was hating Andrew Jackson. They were the party of Henry Clay, the the great compromiser. So it's not surprising that the middle of the country, the upper south, has not left yet. But the Confederate States of America has been formed by the deep south. And it is a very conservative government, by which I mean it's not very radical. It looks very similar to the US Constitution. Their Constitution is almost a word-for-word -word copy with a Southern interpretation on some parts. There are some things that are left out, there are some things that are changed, but it is very, very similar to our Constitution. Let's start by looking at the differences. Here's the Bank of the United States, which was created through the Elastic Clause. Well, Southerners did not include an Elastic Clause in the Confederate States of America. The President in the North, had an unlimited number of terms at this time. Now, nobody had served more than two because Washington didn't serve more than two. But in the South, they put a one-term limit on the president. They gave the president six years, but only one term. They also limited the power of the presidency by letting Congress, their Confederate Congress, select his cabinet. 
some important omissions in the Southern Constitution. The, fe the, the Confederate government was not allowed to create tariffs. It was not allowed to spend money on internal improvements. And it was not allowed to do anything that would infringe on slavery. In fact, they had laws that guaranteed slavery. And the, they made one important decision, though. They chose not to reopen the international slave trade. And here's the reason why. They wanted the support of Europe. They wanted the support of Britain, maybe of France, and other European powers, many of whom who had already banned slavery, let alone the slave trade. Also, they want to encourage the Upper South to join them. And remember, for a number of years, they've been buying slaves from the Upper South. That was a profitable way of making money for people in the Upper South. If they reopen the slave trade in the Confederacy, then the Upper South would say, well, we have less economic incentive to join with you. But if they keep the slave trade closed, then people in the Upper South might say, hey, if we join with the Confederacy, then we can sell our slaves to them and make a profit. They also chose to allow any free states to join the Confederacy. And here's why. They wanted to recreate the Union like it was before the Republican Party, when the institution of slavery was safe. It's these reasons that we could say that the Confederate Constitution and the Confederacy that was created was a very moderate or very conservative approach, not as radical as it may seem. So we have the North or the Union, and we have the Confederacy, but we have one last final attempt to reach a compromise, and it starts with Congressman John Crittenden, who proposes a compromise that gets his name, the Crittenden Compromise. Here's what he proposed. One, extend the Missouri Compromise Line all the way out to the Pacific, 3630. This would open up opportunities for slavery in the Southwest and in the Caribbean, remember the Ostend Manifesto, and down into Central America. Part two of the compromise would have required federal compensation for runaway slaves. That means if a slave catcher can't return a slave to the owner, then federal tax dollars are spent to compensate the slave owner. And the third part would have been a constitutional amendment prohibiting the abolition of slavery. Why would that be important? Well, that would mean that the only way to abolish slavery would be with another constitutional amendment. And getting an amendment passed is a lot, lot harder than just getting a law passed through Congress. Some Republicans, like Henry Seward, the leader of the party, are open to compromise. However, Abraham Lincoln says no, and Lincoln is the one who has just been elected president. We'll explore more why here in a second. First, we should maybe wonder if the South would have ever even accepted it. And it's probably not realistic that the South would have accepted this compromise. Remember, by this time, Southerners want a guarantee of slavery in all territories. After all, that's what the Dred Scott decision had said they should be allowed to do, take your slaves into any territory. Also, Southerners wanted suppression of anti-slavery efforts. They want the federal government to do something to stop abolitionists. Why did Lincoln say no? Well, in Lincoln's opinion, the secessionists were a minority. They were a powerful minority that was in control of politics in the South, but a minority still. Lincoln believed that more people in the South were still loyal to the Union. Second, Lincoln probably would have told us today this would have been the equivalent of negotiating with terrorists. You don't negotiate with someone just because they're upset. Remember, um, they won the election. The Republicans won the election. And he can't go back on the promises he made to supporters simply to appease those people who lost the election. That goes against a big Democratic principle, majority rule. And finally, Lincoln and other Republicans, free soilers, are worried about Southern attempts to spread slavery. They don't want to see slavery spreading into the Caribbean. They don't want to see slavery spreading into Mexico or Central America or anywhere else. So because they won the election, 
because they're worried about the spread of slavery and because Lincoln thought the secessionists were a minority, he does not agree to the Crittenden Compromise. So with compromise failing, there are really two options left. One, to let the South peacefully go on its way and become its own nation. Or two, go to war. Use force to bring them back into the Union. Now, at first, that peaceful separation is supported by some anti-slavery Republicans. It's supported by abolitionists who think, good riddance, let those slave owners go do their own thing. However, it's opposed by the business community. They are really worried about losing their business partnerships with the South. By the time of Lincoln's inauguration, those seven states in the Deep South are out of the country. The Confederacy has already formed, and Lincoln himself supports using force to defend any remaining federal forts in the South. The Confederacy had taken over just about every federal fort or military base in the South. There are only about four left by the time Lincoln takes office. But he says, we're going to use force to defend those. Now, the South fires the first shots at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. And what that does is really unite the North. All right? Lincoln explains that there has been an insurrection against federal authority. In Lincoln's opinion, they haven't left the Union because they can't leave the Union. Instead, they've just rebelled against federal authority. They've attacked a federal, uh, they've attacked federal property. Lincoln requests soldiers from the loyal states to help put down the rebellion. Now, that includes those states in gray, those states in the upper south that had not yet left. These states were not willing to join the south based solely on Lincoln getting elected, but they are upset over the requests, over the, the request to supply soldiers to force other states to stay in the Union. Many of these states believe in the right of secession. They believe in compact theory. They believe in states' rights. Just having a Republican elected didn't upset them enough to leave, but when they are asked to have their young men go and possibly die to try to force others to stay in the Union, something they don't agree with, that causes these states in the upper South, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina, to leave the Union and join with the South. And the South's capital is moved from Alabama all the way up to Richmond, Virginia. Now, what about these states in yellow, these states that were blue on our old map, or light blue? These states that are yellow, and West Virginia is yellow because it will eventually break free from the rest of Virginia, but these states in yellow, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, were all slave states, but we'll call them border states because they are slave states that remain loyal, and I'm using quotes, loyal, they remain loyal to the Union, by which I mean they do not join with the Confederacy. Why? Well, it's for a variety of reasons. In Kentucky, Kentucky said, we are staying neutral in this conflict. And the South is the first to send soldiers into Kentucky. And that really upsets a lot of people in Kentucky feeling like their neutrality has been violated. And therefore, Kentucky stays pretty loyal to the Union. In Maryland, Lincoln used martial law to keep Confederate sympathizers loyal and to keep Confederate sympathizers quiet and keep Maryland in the Union. Out in Missouri, there's a lot of pro-Union people. There's a large German population which weren't willing to side with the Confederacy, and federal troops are stationed in Missouri to maintain order. Nonetheless, Missouri is still a pretty dangerous place during the Civil War with pro-slavery and um, Union people uh, fighting against each other throughout the war. So because of these different reasons for alignment in the Civil War, it means that the Civil War is not originally about slavery. The war is really over the Union and whether or not the Union can be broken up. Can a state leave the nation if it wants to? Or does the Union have to stay together? And can the federal government use force to keep it together?